So if you would say who you are as well, please. Um, Joe Jewell from the World Cancer Research Fund International, based uh, here in London. Um, one of the key themes that seems to have come out from all presentations seems to be around the um, importance of monitoring and evaluating policies in order to be able to see what works, how it works, um, and then that will in turn empower governments and encourage them to take uh, more effective action. Um, but also the speakers have also emphasised that it's a complex situation, you're going to have to do a lot at the same time, so you can't expect individual policies to work in isolation. So I'm just wondering if the speakers could just reflect upon or give their thoughts on how we can um, evaluate policies. So when one policy is introduced, for example, we know not to expect it to reduce obesity in isolation. That's, that's setting the bar far too high for one policy area when it needs to be comprehensive. But what sort of indicators would provide governments with reassurance that it's working and pushing it in the right direction? Thanks very much. Let's work our way around this direction. Thanks. Neville Rigby from the International Obesity Forum. Um, I wish we'd had this report over 10 years ago when we were being bombarded by the food industry globally uh, on the obesity issue. And it's interesting to see that even now your report um, is well out of date. Barry's got the most up-to-date figure in his slides there, 2 billion, not 1.4, which we had years ago. Um, what strikes me is that the discussion so far has been, apart from our international contributors, very domestic and reverting to our own UK perceptions here. But we're actually looking at what is happening globally in terms of development. And we're looking at the issues of agriculture and food prices globally in the context of nutrition. Um, what I wonder here is why we aren't addressing the core issues. Barry's mentioned it, the World Trade Organization, uh, fundamental in this, uh, opening up markets, forcing people to accept obesogenic foods. Um, we now know that our food chain is converging. Fewer and fewer choices are really there. Uh, the diversity of food is being eliminated. Consumers are being forced to accept uh, lower nutritional value in their products. Even fruit and vegetables are poorer in nutrients than they were. 50, 100 years ago, the only change that we see will happen is if we can persuade boardrooms at global level who make the decisions to actually change their attitudes. Okay. I don't see much of this coming out in the discussion yet. Thank you. Hi there. Um, Jeff Knezovich from the Institute of Development Good Studies. Um, the, one of the things that um, I find very interesting about having it here from a development perspective in discussing obesity is uh, we, we see a few examples of things like, for example, Roxana mentioned uh, increased participation of women in the labor force, which I would consider a positive, uh, you know, an example of development progress. Or also from Mexico, we have um, evidence that the much lauded conditional cash transfer program, Oportunidades, may have actually increased uh, obesity among women. Uh, who were recipients of that. There's, I can find the paper, I'll find the reference for you, I see. <laughs> so, so I guess the question is, is um, from a development perspective, can we do healthy development? Okay, thanks. Okay. And, um, and um, one right at the front here, please. Thanks. Uh, thank you, this is a question for Barry and also for Andrew. I'm looking at wire copy in this morning from Princeton saying that the US, uh, US companies have removed 6.4 trillion calories from the US marketplace. How significant is that going to be for the Western world, but also for the developing world? <coughs> OK, one, one, one last one right, right here. Thanks. Um, thank you all for this presentation. My name is Brigitte Larkin. I work for WWF UK. Um, my question is for Barry and Roxana. You both mentioned the um, um, taxation uh, legislation in Mexico about junk food and I would like to know what definition of junk food was used for this legislation thanks so um, I'm, I'm gonna ask this I think each of the speakers to respond but to be um, as disciplined and, and brief as the questioners were with, with, with the questions um, I mean the, the may, maybe Barry there were a couple directed to you. can you hear me Barry yeah, and, and uh, let me, if you would repeat them first, 
uh, to make sure I got the WCRF yeah. one and I can respond to that very quickly. And I got well, I, I think, Barry, there, there, were, there were a couple directed to you. So what, one, I think, was from Joel, um, which maybe relates to all the speakers, but on you know what type of monitoring and evaluation evidence do we need to inform okay. public policy choices? Um, and then there was an observation actually from Neville about the role of the World Trade Organization and international trade as one of the drivers of obesity. So I, th I think maybe if you okay, could start with those. Let, let me try to respond. Oh, sorry. That was very. Uh, excuse me. I'm going to have to leave in 15 and at a quarter to two. So let me try to respond very quickly to, to a number of those points. Number one, in around 30 or 40 countries, we have incredibly good data, just like in the UK, the Cantor data set on household purchases of food. And we also have Nielsen data and other data on media monitoring. So for example, in the US, just like the gentleman mentioned, we monitored all the sales and the purchases of households from 2000 through 2013 of of commercial packaged foods from all the retail sector, from supermarkets to grocery stores to drug stores to clothing stores to gas stations, wherever. Uh, we can do that for media, and people have done it in our country and have showed that the media monitoring, the volunteer efforts in the US are not working. Uh, so we did that as the gentleman asked, and we're doing that in Mexico. We have media data in Mexico, we have commercial purchase data, we can monitor the price changes and the, the purchase changes that go on in these countries through some of these commercial data sets. We can also monitor how they are changing advertising. So are the junk food companies or the sugary beverage companies that are selling this going to up their advertising to try to offset the sales decline? So that is and can go on in the UK, the US, and about 30 to 40 low and middle income countries across the globe. So data exists, it's the will and the funding of the international agencies like the DFIDs, the IDRCs, and others who need to come to the table to start to examine the, some of these things, just like in the UK they could. So that's a point related to WCRF. The cash transfer issue, the unique thing about Mexico is they immediately evaluated a number of the cash transfers, not only the cash transfer, but two other programs that gave food and gave low income stores lower prices and other things. And they found some obesogenic effects and we revised the programs that quickly. The problem is in many, many high income countries and many, many low income countries, we set up our programs become self uh, kind of protective, just like our food stamp program and our school feeding program in the U.S. It took us 30 years to change our school feeding to make it healthier in the U.S. And we're just doing now, I led a national commission on it in 1980. So that's, that's an issue for each country that's very, very important. The World Trade Organization has been the Western Pacific country tried to bar a number of products that were the leading causes of obesity and a number of products in those countries. And they got killed by the World Trade Organization. They had to shift to taxes so they could be equal and not attacking. It is an impediment to many, many nations with many issues related to public health. Uh, I will not say that it can't be dealt with, but I would say in that case, it was my country. They were getting turkey tails and a bunch of other foods from the U.S. that we would never touch that were just pure fat and other unhealthy products and bringing them into these countries in the Western Pacific. And we stopped the WTO, the countries, from banning the import. So WTO has a role. It has many other roles that we haven't talked about. I don't want to go to. Uh, lastly, yes, the U.S. retailers, 16 of them, did through reformulation, through remarketing, also because a lot of products, part of it is we now have 36% private label in the U.S. of our purchases. It's gone from around 6% to 36% in 12 years. So it's moving toward the U.K. model slowly. 
But for all these reasons, yes, these 16 companies did cut calories. It, we did cut U.S. calories total, ignoring the recession effects. We actually have, for a while, led to an evening off in calorie uh, and obesity in the country. But we're seeing a shift in the last year in purchases back up, which I think is because of targeted marketing going on with our minorities and others. We've tracked that. So I suspect we're going to see a shift backwards. Uh, yes, regulations could have got all the companies to follow along. One of the problems is, as, as our retail colleague mentioned, we have data. We showed 16 companies did it. We can show other companies didn't do it. So then what happens? Do the 16 companies that did it go and say, let's regulate it? No, they don't want regulation. So we, this is a very complex thing. I'm working with retailers the same way. We have some retailers pushing just like in the UK. Thanks, we have Barry. Who won't touch it. Thank and I'm done. Th I've got to leave. Thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Barry, just, just to say a huge thank you to all of us from um, over here. So this is a brilliant presentation and, and, and also for that response. Thanks, Barry. Okay, bye bye. Um, Steve, I mean, in a way, one of the toughest questions I think was sort of directed at you, which is, uh, you know, the question of can we get development without obesity? That wasn't precisely the way it was phrased. Uh, I won't answer that question. What? I, what I, I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer a simpler question with, with a simple reflection on the way that. Um, things tend to guide one's thoughts. Very late in the day, I think it was a week ago, that I came across a, an intriguing study in the New Eng England Journal of Medicine, cohort study from the US, going back 30 or 40 years. About 100,000 Americans in it. So you look at this kind of weight of evidence and you say, oh my goodness, um, this, is, this is huge amounts of data, massive control, degrees of freedom, and so on. And that argued that the expanding American waistline, which we know is one of the worst in the world, is the result of an imbalance daily at the population mean of about 50 to 100 kilocalories a day. Yeah? <coughs> if that's correct, if that, I mean, that's half a sandwich, that's 15 minutes walking, something like that. Yeah? If that's correct, let's not get too fussed about this is an impossible question. Because if we're trying to nudge all of us at the population mean to lay off half a sandwich or walk for another 15 minutes, we shouldn't be quite so dispirited. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that what Tim and Barry have told us uh, is dispiriting, but it, but it is a little overwhelming. And it does kind of suggest that we, we have to turn the world upside down. And as something of a newcomer to this area, I look at, I look at a a stat like that, and I say, maybe we don't have to turn the world upside down. Maybe we are in a world of not just nudges, but small nudges rather than a shove. Thank you. C can I get, um, Roxana, can, can you, uh, are you still, still with us? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I couldn't really hear any of the questions, though. Uh, okay, uh, well, look, okay. Let, 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 me, let, let, me let me put a couple to you. Um, I, I guess two that I think are particularly relevant for from a, from a Mexican perspective, or maybe, maybe three actually. Um, one is, you know, what what difference has the World Trade Organization and international trade made as one of the drivers of the obesity epidemic in in Mexico? Um, a second set of questions were about, you know, what is the type of monitoring and evaluation evidence that can make a difference with government and public policy? Um, in Mexico. And then there was one specific question actually on opportunidades um, on you know wh whether the benefit system and the cash transfer system in opportunidades had actually uh, inadvertently in some way fueled the underlying problem. Okay, the first, uh, I'm not, first of all, I'm not an economist as Barry is, so he's more into the world trade issue, but I think uh, he's right. There's um, uh, there's been a, 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 the, the way the World Trade Organization is controlling uh, imports and exports into Mexico has changed a bit of the uh, food availability, as, as Barry was actually saying. And uh, 
probably uh, one of the main issues for us was the inclusion in the NAFTA meet, uh, agreement. You know, going into into uh, a, a, a trading um, agreement with the United States and Canada changed importantly our food supply in in, in, in many ways, and also changed our, our income through food exportation. And you know, this has been going on for a long time. And I think I, you know, I think this has a very important. Uh, Effect that has had an important effect on, on the way agriculture and the food industry in Mexico. The, the, before the NAFTA agreement, uh, Mexico was very protective of its own food production, was very protective of the, food, the, the national food industry, and the, the feeding patterns were more traditional. Once the, we went to the NAFTA, we received all these American and some European food franchises with the fast food industry growing very much and, and the availability of a lot of industrial products that didn't used to be here. So I do think that the, the, the international trading uh, issues have affected the, 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 our food intake and the food availability in Mexico. And, and I'm not sh really sure that any um, monitoring uh, was placed at that time in terms of nutrition and health. You know, the, the monitoring was more in terms of, of the economy part, but not necessarily in terms of the obesity or the undernutrition effects of uh, of the changes that were caught being caused by by our inclusion in these trading uh, agreements. Right. Thank um, that's the first question, I think. Um, I'm I'm not sure if that was. Uh, that, that, that was fine. Be, um, Roxana, because we're running a little bit close to time, if you could keep the the, the next couple of responses uh, fairly brief. The monitoring is being in place right now in terms of um, uh, of the, the changes in tax, as Barry was saying, the government is trying very hard to monitor what is going to happen with these increases in taxes for the fizzy beverages and the sugar and the junk food and also with the, the changing portion size. So I hope I hope we'll be, we'll be having a periodical data, say yearly, on, on the changes in that and see what happens. Hopefully something good will happen. And the, the terms of, the, uh, of the, ben the third question, which was the benefits of the cash programs in Mexico, well, I think we clearly see a benefit in terms of undernutrition. We've basically, as I, I showed the data, undernutrition has basically disappeared, but I think there has been an important effect, negative effect on the obesity issue. And although they did try to change the program immediately after they did the first evaluation, I'm not sure it's been enough. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Roxana. Thank you. Um, look, just, just to say, I know I've, uh, we, we're running a little bit over, but um, actually partly because I'm enjoying this so much, uh, we're going to continue until around um, five, I think. Um, so I'm going to take another round of um, three to four short questions, and then I'll let um, Andrew and Tim respond, and Steve have the uh, have the final word, as it were. So let's start. Any questions over this side? No. Please. Hi, my name is Robert Leach, and I'm an independent science writer. And, I've, oh. and so I have two questions um, from a sustainability perspective. I mean, can we continue to produce food at this rate? And then also, from a neurobiological standpoint, you know, given the similarities between reward mechanisms that are exploited during overeating, and then also looking at the health costs associated with obesity, why wouldn't the government start to tax all hyperpalatable foods? You know, looking at both high fat and high sweet foods across the board. I mean, there's some pretty big sugar and fat lot. Well, fat not quite so much, but there's definitely very big sugar and salt companies. Why wouldn't you use those as direct targets? Um, and I did, I did my PhD looking at reward mechanisms and overeating behavior, um, actually at Sussex, which is quite nice, so, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, one right behind you. 
And this is a question for Steve, sorry, Tom, uh, Tom Levitt, a uh, food policy student. Um, did you do any analysis of awareness? I didn't see it in the report. Um, is there much awareness in developing countries about what is a good and what is a bad diet, however you define that? Thank you, since you've got the mic. <laughs> um, Duncan Williamson from WWF. Um, we've done a lot of work on sustainable diets, and I think we've demonstrated very clearly that a healthy diet is also a sustainable diet. Um, but one thing we're aware of in the food system is the food system is in trouble. We know climate change is happening and it's going to impact on our ability to, food, to grow food. We know water is increasingly getting more scarce. It's going to affect our ability to grow food. Biodiversity is running out, as Tim mentioned. There's nitrogen pollution, phosphate pollution. The oceans are overfished. So we know that there's a very limited time frame left from an environmental standpoint. We have also know from this report that there's a huge health problem that's killing people every single day, and hundreds of thousands of people. And it, in what, the last 10 years, all that's happened has got worse and worse and worse and worse. And arguably, it's people's lives at stake, and it's, we've got to do something about it very, very quickly. So from an environmental and a social po point of view, Thanks. how do we do things quickly? That's a simple question for somebody. <laughs> uh, let's go over here now. Uh, Sarah Toulay at Forum for the Future. Um, it's a question for Andrew. Um, you mentioned that you'd like to see more evidence of the effectiveness of behaviour change and that um, it doesn't necessarily tally with what you see in the way um, purchasing behaviour is influenced in supermarkets. Um, I guess my challenge is, do you think there's an appetite on behalf of supermarkets to share the information that they have? So I'd imagine they have quite a good understanding of what drives people's in, um, decisions when they go to the supermarket. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to throw one, one more in, which is we, we've actually got quite a big online audience for this as well, and there's one question that's um, coming from, from, from that source, which is, well, it's making the observation that many of the issues that are being discussed, the big macro issues about pricing, you know, are, are very difficult to tackle. And that, for to, to quote the question, it may, come, it may come that we have to insist that adult individuals take responsibility, children less so, for their own consuming behaviour, question mark. It comes from one of your students, actually. Oh, no. There you are. <laughs> so, um, so, look, th there's, a, there's, a, there's a broad set of questions there, and I, I, I don't want to sort of editorialise the, 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 the questions, but, um, Andrew, I, I mean, I, I guess there are a couple of you, you know, that one, you've already raised the monitoring and evaluation question, so you, you might want to respond to that. But there, there is this taxation mm -hmm. issue as well that, I think you know, despite the lack of evidence in some areas, you know, we don't lack evidence that saturated fats, sugars and salts are responsible for you know, major public health burden. And in, a knock and in a pure economic sense, there is, an ex there is arguably an externality case for taxation to equivalent cost levels. And there are probably other issues you want to take up as well, in including the last question, but may maybe like if we could start with So, you. deal with the tax issue first. I think it's the complexities around how you construct the tax, and don't forget we do have VAT in this country, of course. Now, if you look at fats, for example, the problems, as you'll be aware, the Danes ran into with their saturated fat tax was all around actually nat what you the consumer might perceive to be natural yeah. products, dairy, meat, those sorts of things, not necessarily the processed area. So I think there are, now sugar tax is probably, possibly more directional that you could possibly direct it more to sugar than you could to something like fat. And I guess that the final point on the fat tax is you need to remember the strength of the farming lobby and the agricultural lobby in every country around the world, uh, which happened in Denmark, of course, and would absolutely happen in Europe. Yeah. And that tax would probably have to be cleared in Europe. Uh, Credit Suisse did a really interesting report on sugar and actually the dangers of it, you know, just looking at diabetes, et cetera. And it was quite interesting because it was put together by financial researchers mm -hmm. as opposed to health researchers. And sometimes that starts to drive the point home about how expensive um, obesity is. And, and it's not a culpability uh, yeah. issue. It's just looking at the facts yeah. and how expensive it is. Sorry. So there are some problems with that. Um, data, yes, we do share data, actually, at the moment. Um, the problem we've generally had is getting um, the request for data to narrow down to exactly what data people want and what they're going to use it for tends to be the problem because as you can imagine supermarkets do collect a lot of data and they have a lot of data and therefore it's actually quite expensive to mine that data to get to what you might want and that's been one of the problems with it. Um, 
great plug because you both have been involved in the production on sustainability, launch of the next better retailing climate, retailers' contribution to how you can actually produce a much more sustainable supply chain, 29th of January. So you'll be able to see all the targets we've set going forward. So couldn't let it go without a plug. Okay, and I'm sure Tim won't be able to let it go without a response to the plug. <laughs> no, 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 Tim is very happy. Um, uh, Tim is very happy because I think we've got, I mean, I was trying to end my talk on an optimistic note. I think there's actually a, agreement that the sort of preliminary mapping of this problem is over, actually. Uh, we, and we've had preliminary forays to do something about it, and they haven't worked, or they've been driven back. And we now, we're in a, a rather interesting period of where we're going to have to do something around the world much more serious than has been done so far. So I'm actually very optimistic. I think there's a, a willingness in very surprising places to entertain bigger change than was previously being even considered. I'd like to, if I may, Kevin, just go qu very quickly back to the question that Neville Rigby raised and a mixture of what Joe from WCRF raised. Um, I think there is a problem of institutions. The, the, the reality of the productionist paradigm was that it was put in place at national basis in the 30s and 40s, rolled out in the 50s. At the same time as a global set of institutions emerged which were actually split. The Bretton Woods, this is Kevin's original sort of work 30 years ago. Bretton Woods institutions, the IMF, the Bank for Reconstruction, and now the WTO, which is slightly different, uh, have been at odds with the UN system. And the UN system itself has been very split. The FAO is much stronger and better funded, and it is very weak, compared to the WHO, which is tiny and very lacking in points of leverage, actually. And yet, we have an emergence of very powerful corporations at regional and global level. There's a mismatch basically, of policy influence and levers. And we need to be talking about that. What would we need if we really wanted to address obesity in this complex way beyond as well as within nation states? That discussion about institutional levers, frankly, is not happening yet. It's beginning to happen around the issues that uh, Duncan and uh, WWF have been addressing. I, too, am interested in on sustainability of diet because it brings together health and the environment. I think that has to be the way to go. We've got to bring health and environmental discourses together at an institutional level, at multi-level. And I want to say a very nice plug about the European Union, which doesn't get a good press in the world. It's actually the only policy institutional forum in the world where this is vaguely coming onto the agenda. Not enough, but vaguely. And we need to help that and urge it. The uh, resource efficient Europe directive, or oh sorry, um, communique, the roadmap to resource efficient Europe, apparently says nothing about obesity, but is about the environment and ecosystems and energy use. Well, energy is calories, which is fat, which is sugar. There's a very interesting debate emerging at the European level about what would Europe look like if it actually was addressing public health. The final point was Margaret and also then uh, Duncan raised the issue of time frame. Uh, there is an urgency about this. I think the obesity debate should not be separated from the wider debate about sustainability. Um, and there is a real problem. Various people in questions raised it, and they were right, in my view. Although I was defending individuals as not being able to do anything about this uh, very much, the rooms for manoeuvre are quite low, clearly there is an individual level of responsibility. I, not anyone else, put things into my mouth. But the shaping of the environment, the context within which I do that, that goes beyond my individual capacities. And it's that mixture that we've got to uh, encourage policymakers to address. Uh, so I think on that note, I'll stop. Thanks very much, Tim. Steve. Um, I've got three things on my scratch pad. By the way, I was asked very specifically, did we look at um, awareness of diet. No, we didn't. I haven't seen any studies which, which look across those by, by countries. But three things that I have on, on, on my scratch pad is, uh, in a research institute are, are the following three areas that we need to understand and, and push further on. One is the whole area of behavior. 
and within that, for those of us who are economists, how far we can get anywhere by shifting prices to reflect health externalities, environmental externalities, whatever social values we have, can we do it as economists like me would always be optimistic with a few taxes and subsidies and so on, uh, working at the margin, or is it going to uh, require something more than that? The second theme that we've had here is this whole area of evidence and, and credibility and building a base where we can talk to industry, we can talk to governments, we can talk to the general public, and we can say, here is evidence, we know this works, we know that doesn't work, now let's have a debate about what we can actually agree on as a, as, as, as a program of action. And the third area comes very strongly from Duncan's provocation, and that is the emerging global agenda that will be with us, I'm sure, in the next few decades, which are going to be these tremendous debates about fairness. And diet is going to be one of those. Can we have a world where everybody is eating 80 kgs of, of meat a year, as we do in Europe, 120 kgs, as is the case in the USA? Or in the interests of fairness, do we have to get some kind of compact which limits our consumption of that? That, that debate will then have a public health element, will perhaps help and stimulate that particular debate. But I'm sure in 20 years' time, across the world, we will have to have those conversations. I think it's happening already. Mm. It's happening already. It's the one that industry is most worried about. It's the one that drives politicians back into their boxes instantly. I quote the senior civil servant in Europe on one of the direct uh, uh, DGs who said to me, I cannot talk about meat. I cannot talk about meat. I cannot talk about meat. I think it's up to us to therefore make her to talk about meat. So he's a commissioner prone to repetition in this particular yeah. case. <laughs> <laughs> I merely raised the issue of sustainability of diets and I cannot talk about meat. I cannot talk about meat. I cannot, even I with my pea brain can remember that quote. <laughs> okay. Staggering defensiveness. So, <laughs> so, I mean, may, maybe if I could just end with a, a few comments. That um, actually, in a, in a previous life, I used to be director of the Human Development Report, and what, you know, one of the stock in trade of the human de part of the stock in trade of the Human Development Report would be that you know you would compare how countries were doing on economic, on the conventional economic indicators of well-being, you know, their export growth, their GDP growth. And then you would find other indicators, you know, like child survival rates or literacy rates, and compare the two. And of course, you know, the, the countries with the, the biggest gaps, or you could highlight the biggest gaps, would have, you know, a big public policy problem that something was happening that was stopping wealth being converted into opportunity. And it, it really strikes me with Steve's report and, and with the literature more generally that we actually have exactly the same issue yeah. here, that yeah. the way that we've traditionally measured progress is totally misaligned with the well-being of people. Absolutely. And there's, so there's a whole set of sort of measurement challenge, and, and I think narrative challenges, actually, about how we think about, about progress in the world. I, it, it also strikes me that we have almost the mother of all collection, collective action problems here, it, that some aspects of it are familiar from other areas, you know, say tobacco or road safety in seat belts, or, or crash helmets. But the range of issues underpinning this, Tim, as you outlined, that you know, there are behavioral aspects, there are institutional aspects, it's rooted in the whole production system, you know, it's deeply ingrained in personal psychology as well. You know, I, I think it sort of raises problems of a level that you know, even the most sophisticated behavioral economics, and probably psychology, that doesn't really get to grips okay. with. And so, you know, there's, a, there's another set of challenges there. I, I mean, it also strikes me that you know, this really goes to the heart of what is the responsibility of government in relation to their citizens in this area. That because a lot of the response that you, know, you would get to some of the issues that you raise, you know, would, especially through having this discussion in the US, would be that you know, this guy is a promoter of the nanny state. You, know, you want to tell people what they can do and what they can eat. And the other way of expressing that is you know, what is it the responsibility of governments to stand by and watch people walk over the cliff? So, you know, I think there's, there's a question about political choice and freedom, which is really at, at the heart of this 
as well, which surprisingly doesn't actually come out in a lot of the discussion, to, to my mind. You know, it's implicit, but it doesn't seem to surface in the way that you, you might expect. And, and also the power relationships. So, you, you know, I mean, living in the US, I was always really struck by, you know, whenever there was a labeling debate about high fructose corn syrup or trans fats in food, you would be guaranteed the next day you would have big ads all over the place from the food industry explaining how you know these weren't actually problems at all and were perfectly healthy things and but you know there are very you know there are uh, as you said there are, you know it's not just i mean i'm not like, having a dig no, no, we don't we don't use either of those so that's fine here Carry on. <laughs> what a, what a really yeah. but you know you've got the farm lobby the agribusiness interest and and in a way you know it, this comes back i think the responsibility of governments to inform and protect their citizens in relation to yeah. actors who are far more powerful than, than, than they are. And, uh, and I guess the last point, and um, you know, hopefully Steve will be taking this up in the later ver versions of, of the research, is that you know, we, we're clearly dealing with an issue that isn't amenable to resolution by pressing individual or pulling individual public policy levers. You know, it's either you pull the whole lot of them, you know, whether it's about transport or production or, or you know, regulation, uh, or it seems not to work. And, and fragmented approaches clearly don't work in this area. So, you know, I think there's a lot for us to think about as a development institute, and, and, and hopefully you know, this meeting will be the, the, the start of a, of a wider and deeper dialogue o over time with, 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 with all of you. So I want to end by just saying a huge thank you. It was a really fantastic uh, discussion, actually. A huge thank you to Steve and, and to Sherada Keats, who's, uh, who's over there, who is his co-author. Hi. Um, and to uh, all, all of our speakers, Rosanna in, in Mexico, Barry, who's, who's, who's left us. Um, but thank you to everyone.